JerseySports.com's original multimedia series talking all things football across North Jersey. This is Season 5, Episode 6. The weather has changed and it feels like football. I am Corey Doviak being joined by my illustrious panel of North Jersey football insiders, starting with the venerable one, Mr. Jimmy Avatabile. What's going on, Jimmy? Hey, what's up, Corey? Another uh, exciting week coming up this week. We're starting to get down to the nitty-gritty. Yes, we certainly are, and uh, Mr. Nitty Gritty himself joins us live on the line from where are you this week, Head Husky Brian Carr? Right now, I'm in Chicago. I'm right near O'Hare Airport for this week. What's the weather like out in the Midwest, in the Windy City? Uh, it's around 60 and sunny today. It's cooler weather out here, so uh, just like we were getting used to the East Coast, so yeah. it'll be coming that way. By the weekend, we we'll should have a cool uh, you know, night, Friday night. Saturday, out in the East Coast. This update brought to you by the Weather Channel, but we are going to talk football. That's the idea behind it here. Rutherford's Andy Howell's going to join us, and you'll know why when we get a little bit deeper into what's going on in the NJIC. And here's the thing, if I can break it down relatively succinctly. In the NJIC, at least in the short term, in the immediate future, this week it all comes down to one game. It's Rutherford against Manchester. The winner will grab the last spot in the second-ever edition of the NJIC playoffs, with New Milford having already secured the bid from the Liberty Division, Hasbrook Heights already having secured the bid from the Meadowlands Division, and Wallington uh, free and clear in the Patriot Division. Rutherford and Manchester will play for the last spot in the Final Four from the N- to be the NJIC Colonial Division representative. And, Jimmy, we'll get into this a little bit more with uh, Andy Howe, obviously. But just, uh, uh, again, it, it's the, a great thing that they did in the NJIC. They put in this little playoff system here, and it, it gives you a little taste of what's to come when the state tournament kicks in here. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's good for the, for the top teams, obviously, that are, are vying for a championship. Plus, also, it helps them with the power points. You know, like we, we couldn't talk to Coach uh, Howell. I mean, if they beat Manchester, that's that's a tremendous amount of power points, which will help them in their state seating as well. So there's a lot on the line there. For the, for the teams that are in the middle of the league, it gives them two extra games where they can match themselves up against competitive teams, hopefully, you know, uh, make them better. And for the bottom teams that are struggling, that matches them up against the other bottom teams, which hopefully allows competitive games and allows teams that don't have some wins to get some wins. So I think it's a, a home run all the way around. Yeah, by leaving those last two weeks open, you, you really do a service to the member schools because if you're having a bad year, you can go down and, and get it. It's almost like the promotion relegation in uh, English soccer. You know, at the bottom they're going to be fighting it out, in the middle they're going to be fighting it out, and in the top they're going to be fighting it out. Uh, it really is a well-devised plan. All right, we'll talk about that with Andy Howell. On the public school side of the North Jersey Super Football Conference, uh, last week, I don't want to term it as such, but I will say it was a little bit of a snoozer. It was hard to find a game that meant anything around North Jersey. So I think uh, later on, after we talk to the coaches, what we should do there is kind of go around and uh, talk about what's coming up. Because now it ramps back up. we got games with playoff implications this week, reputations, PowerPoints, uh, records, everything on the line. Uh, we're going to run around and get to some of those games too. And then in the non-public section of the North Jersey Super Football Conference. You got the same old, same old. You got the big boys banging heads against each other. Right, uh, you know, they've been doing it the last couple weeks, and they will continue right on into this weekend. Right, Brian? Hey, that's for sure. The big guys are kind of, uh, you know, we're seeing a little separation between the top and the middle guys. And Obviously, Joe's had a struggle with um, a good uh, Pope John team, but obviously we went to the big game, and we could talk about Burton Catholic. I mean, Burton Catholic, we've seen them early, and struggled in the middle when they traveled and they've come back to New Jersey and, and pretty much dominated here the last uh, three games, the last two and a half games, they've really uh, taken control and so um, and we've got a lot of, we've got a few quotes if we get them on the air here, we did a story also on North Jersey Sports talk about them uh, planting the flag to be the number one team in New Jersey for Calvin. Yeah, well why don't we do that now because there's not much to say afterwards about the non-publics I mean you got Pope John traveling to D.C. this week 
Listen, Pope John, they were undefeated, and they gave St. Joseph a game, which bodes well for the uh, non-public Group 3 state playoffs. You know, obviously Pope John has put himself in in the mix there with uh, St. Joe's and DePaul. DePaul will be playing at Seton Hall Prep this weekend. St. Joseph's will play at St. Peter's Prep. St. Peter's Prep going to have to rebound now after taking one on the chin against Bergen Catholic. And the, the Paramus Catholic Don Bosco game, not as much on the radar as maybe it has been in years past. Both of those teams struggling a little bit. But, you know, as we've talked about in uh, previous shows, not dead yet and certainly can. There, there's plenty of time to regroup for them because they're going to make the state playoffs and they, all they got to do is get hot for a couple weeks in a row and they can be right back where they want to be. So uh, let's just focus in on that Bergen Catholic game that you did this past weekend. You said we had a story on NorthJerseySports.com, but actually you had a story on NorthJerseySports.com. You wrote it. You took the pictures. Uh, it's up there now for your viewing pleasure. Why don't you give us your impressions of uh, Bergen Catholic, which has a Division One quarterback who seems to be playing like a Division One running back nowadays? I mean, there was, uh, you know, the, the, I think it was a really good game. Um, you know, the Bergen played an, a great game on their side of the ball. Um, you know, they really uh, dominated a, a very good St. Peter's team who, uh, you know, I had a feeling, hey, they, St. Peter's was dominating and had a good, tough game the previous week against the Paul and I, all signs pointed to there being a really good game, but um, you know Bergen got ahead, was able to seem to have control the whole game, um, gave up a few points in the first half. They probably should have been ahead by more than twenty-one-seven. Missed a couple field goals, one off the upright, um, you know, and then you know St. Peter's did come back, which you know I was talked to someone on the sidelines. St. Peter's the previous week had lost, or they were down twenty-one-seven. They came back to win the game. Same score again here at halftime, down 21-7. They score a touchdown, it's 21-14. Maybe we have a game. But uh, Bergen, in their normal MO in the last couple of weeks, they seem to step it up. They see the competition, they address it, and they take off from there. And Johnny Langan had three TDs in the in the second half, and they took control. I think both sides of the ball took control. Play of the game, I thought, and maybe I don't know if Jimmy thought it, was the big sack um, by uh, it was John High. I think there was a player, or maybe I'm wrong on that one. I think it wasn't him, it was another player. But And then uh, John Batiste uh, recovered the ball and scampered in for a 55-yard TD, uh, made it 21-7. And I think that really set the tone for the rest of the game. You mentioned there that it was John Batiste, if I'm saying that right, which I'm probably not. But yeah. you did an interview with him after the game. Let's get his thoughts after the win over St. Peter's Prep. Brian Carr here, North Jersey Sports. I'm here with Javante John Batiste from Bergen Catholic. Big play. I mean, there's a lot of big plays in this game. Yes, sir. Talk about the game, and then we'll talk about another big play. Uh, coming into the game, we said we're going to have to get after them. The offense is going to have to get after them, and that's completely what we did. Right. Uh, on, that, on a play by me on a touchdown, we called uh, Canes a corner blitz, right. and the corner really came up, laid a big hit, and I was able to score. I mean, right. that, it was a very big play. So now in the, in the second half, it got close. You guys were up 21-14. They said, just scored. What do you think changed everything where you guys come on and score three TDs to kind of ice the game? Anything you guys did different? Uh, no. We, we've we always known that playing in the Big North, you'll be in a dog fight every other week. So we just keep fighting you. And plus, we know we worked harder than them, and no other team works just like us. Mm-hmm. So we got to do what we have to do. What did Coach tell you at halftime to kind of get you motivated to come out and be ready in the second half? Uh, he said, don't be too excited. There's always a second half, and you got to treat it like it's zero zero. It's another, it's a big game. Right. Talk about your quarterback, Johnny. Johnny had three TDs in the second half. Yeah. Talk uh, about Johnny. Um, going against John, you know, every day, it's it's really a process. He's a, a a great player. You know, he has he has the tools to run and pass the ball, right. which makes him a big threat in the right. offense. The running game seemed to be really good. You had um, uh, so you had Josh running really hard. You had uh, Mr. Johnson running hard and Johnny. So it looks like the, the running game really has picked up. Yeah. You know. uh, the running game was able to pick up because we, we get after the whole line, you know. Right. We, we get them to be better every day and to work on their stance and techniques. Right. Talk about John High. John High had a couple sacks. <laughs> he really stepped up today, I think. Yeah, John High, he was a big improvement. We always known he was going to be a player for us, and he came out today and showed it. Good. So what do you have to do this week? Get ready for another big game. 
every week it's another game. It's another game. <laughs> just a just a normal week, right? And it's not a normal week. I mean, yeah. every week is a big week. It's, right. It's going in. You got to prepare. You got to put the last week behind you right. and treat it like it's a fresh start. All right, Bry, good stuff there. And uh, also you caught up with the head coach of the Crusaders, Nunzio Campanelli. Here's what he had to say after the game. Here at Ardell, our Burton Catholic just uh, dominated the third and fourth quarter, uh, taking a 41-14 win over uh, St. Peter's Marauders, uh, previously with the number one team in the well, you know, a couple things. One, uh, we're still a very young team. We're playing a ton of juniors, especially on defense. But we are playing juniors that have been playing for one and two years. So they're not they're not rookies. And our, our seniors are tremendous leaders. The guys that are on the field, the Langans, the Classies, the Javantes, you know, Sean Toomey's. But also the seniors that aren't on the field. You know, they, they understand, you know, they've been through tough games, they've been through tough losses. So I'm super proud of the way that they act, conduct themselves, the way they practice every day. You know, I mean, you know, they, they understand, you know, the heartbreak that comes with letting up for one second, you know, and uh, so I think that that's a big part of, you know, being able to win tough games. You know, uh, you know, you win them kind of Monday to Friday and you know, the game takes care of itself like that. I want to play a class here. Every game, you know, he's coming up with some, some, I mean, some NFL catches. Yeah, he's a money player. He, he really is. You know, he, he's he got uh, he, he's got incredible hands. He catches the ball great in traffic. He's got great body control. Um, he works his tail off every day. Um, he's super smart. You know, I mean, he's not just like, you know, book smart going to Princeton. He's, he's very football savvy. You know, you didn't put him in a game on defense. You practice for 10 minutes and jump in there and knows, you know, all the coverages. It takes everyone else four months to know. So, you know, he gets it. Talk about Tyler Devera. He had a good play, a good touchdown. First yeah. First of the game. A couple good plays. Uh, you know, in our offense, the tight end is one of the most critical players. I mean, because he's a... He's a point of attack player. He is a pulling blocker. He's a receiver, and he does so many good things. I mean, he had a great catch down the field here to extend the drive. He had a catch for a touchdown. Um, he had a drive starter over here uh, as well as I thought he blocked really well against, you know, their two edge setters. They don't get better than those guys, you know, and uh, we were able to run the ball. We were able, you know, and, and a lot of that was the, the job that he did, especially we lost Aeneas, uh early second quarter, and that, you know, we really planned on playing a lot of two tight end stuff, and we couldn't do that. What about, talk about your running game today. I know it's really seemed to be well diverse. Yeah, you ran Josh, Rasheem, and then Johnny. It seemed to be well, you know, maybe Johnny orchestrates that, right? Yeah, you know, I mean, well, one is, you know, the you know they're all very dynamic players, and they, you know, they all are physical runners. They're all pretty fast. They're all, you know, I mean, Amir's exceptionally fast, but uh, they... They're very unselfish guys. They want to win. They want to do what it takes to win. And, you know, they just, if they keep playing that way, and Johnny's, you know, Johnny's the guy pulling the strings, you know. I mean, he's the guy that makes the decisions, and uh, he's really doing a better job on that every day. I mean, in our offense, the quarterback is making a play and making a decision on every play. It's not just do I keep it or give it. It's which run play are we in, you know, the progressions in the past, the protections. Um, and he just does a phenomenal job. He works, you know, he's a Incredible worker. He's a really mature player. Yeah, Johnny had three TDs in the second half. I mean, I don't know what happened there. All of a sudden, he scored three TDs, but the running game was going all game. We tell our guys the night before every game, you know, on offense, the last thing I tell them every week since the day I walked in the door was be unselfish. Your turn's coming. You know, however it happens, I you know, I personally couldn't care less who scores touchdowns. The team scores a touchdown. You know, today it was Johnny. Uh, you know, next week it's Ramir. You know, the first game it was classy. The last week it was Josh or whatever. I, you know, I... Doesn't, doesn't matter. matter. You know what I mean? And that's a sign of a great team. You know what I mean? Michael Feaster, I'm not sure he caught a pass today. He's the most critical, maybe the most critical player in our offense. You know what I mean? He, he does everything. He's, you know, he converts third downs. You know, but today was Garrett Cody that did that. So, you know, who knows, you know, who will be next week. It's good. You need them. Yeah, you need all, the, all your players. You can't yeah, there's too many good players right? in, in this league. That, you know, you got to be, every guy that goes on the field has got to be ready to have the ball. And, Jimmy, you were there, too. Before we move on here to our first guest of the evening, why don't you give us a quick thought. What do you think standing on the sidelines, Bergen Catholic, St. Peter's Prep? Well, I, I think where Bergen has really improved is their physicality. Offensively, their offensive line is, is knocking people off the ball. Again, another almost 300 yards rushing. Johnny Lang and Josh McKenzie, who's, you know, came in with all those high expectations, was hurt a lot of his freshman and sophomore year. He's a kid that's just a, a very, very tough runner. 
He makes contact. He never goes down on the first hit. Always seems to get another two or three yards after first contact. And then they bring in Raheem Johnson. So they really have a three-headed monster running the ball. Uh, I think the difference is Johnny Langan is healthy this year. Uh, obviously very physical, a 225-pound running back, which really helps. But I think where the most improvement has come is their defense. I mean, they're really, which was suspect early in the year, we talked about it, they've become very physical. Uh, the big play that Brian was talking about was when they blitzed their sophomore quarterback, Jordan uh, Morant. That's the edge. They yep. blitzed him, and he sacked the, the quarterback from uh, St. Peter's, and it was a fumble, and picked up and ran in 55 yards, but you're starting to see some of Bergen's young talent. They're sophomores. They have a sophomore line, middle linebacker they inserted. Last name is Cruz. Uh, Cruz. Very, very tough physical player. So I think Bergen is getting better and better uh, week in and week out, and I wonder if that has anything to do with Fred Stengel and uh, Coach Toll on the staff. Well, it certainly doesn't hurt. I can tell you that. Uh, that's that's for sure. So Bergen Catholic separating itself now, uh, taking over the number one spot in the statewide rankings, taking it from St. Peter's Prep and doing it the right way on the football field. So we'll see how it goes from there. But let's step back now into the NJIC, our favored small school department of North Jersey High School football, as we welcome in our guest on this episode of the Monday Morning Quarterback the head coach of the Rutherford Bulldogs, he is Andy Howell. He joins us. Coach, thanks for taking some time here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. Coach, thanks a lot for having me on the show again. It's a, uh, it's a quite an honor. Well, it's an annual event now, and uh, that must mean that good things are going on around the Rutherford program. And I'll start by saying this. I mean, last year I think there, there were some high expectations around the program. Started off good, had some injuries that maybe curtailed some of the things you wanted to do. This year, maybe not as much expected, and all you have done to this point is get to 5-0 and with uh, the biggest game left on the NJIC regular season calendar this week against Manchester. So, you know, talk about that aspect of it. I don't want to say you're overachieving, but maybe, you know, from the out- outside perspective, maybe some people think you are. Hey, that's all right. We're, that's the way we like it. We want to fly under the radar. <laughs> you know, get the bull. You know, we don't we don't like having the bullseye on our on our chest. So, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, whether you look at us as overachieving or not, this is kind of what we expected this year. Um, we got a, a good group of kids who are, are, are pretty confident. I think that's one of the main reasons for our success this year is that we got, you know, our kids are. It doesn't matter who we're playing; they they, they expect to win. You know, so they're pretty confident. In it. And a lot of that kind of stems from the, the last two years of success that we had, and, and those guys being a part of it. You know, so. Uh, you know they're kind of hungry and they want to they want to keep it going. Yeah, no, you've definitely done that, and I certainly took notice when you beat the powerhouse Palisades Park Tiger Lions in Week Three, forty-two to nothing. I mean that always, you know, when you... isn't that your uh, your alma mater? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> I want I wanted to get there first this week because at some point in the show, every time one of these two guys, my uh, illustrious panel of NorthJerseySports.com football insiders, likes to bring up the result of Palisades Park's last game. So I got to jump on both of you boys this week, uh, Jimmy. Go ahead, talk to the coach (laughs) yeah coach i mean obviously you mentioned the success Corey mentioned the success of the program two years ago you you lose a tough game in the state final last year you come back and you lost a a shootout to a very very good lenape valley team you lose kevin kazakowski who was a a star for you and your quarterback tom reed if you can mention the kids that have filled in for them obviously your you know your your offense is I don't know if it's as explosive as it was back then, but you're certainly putting a lot of points on the board. Right. We uh, we definitely lost a lot of high-profile names that uh, contributed to our success over the last three years. But, uh, you know, and I think that, just, like you said, being on the doorstep of a, of a championship the last two years and just not being able to get over that hump has kind of motivated our guys for this season. Um, but some of the guys that we, – we, I want to say we had about eight or nine players who – uh, started at least a game or two for us last year, so there is a little more uh, talent that returned than most people think. Uh, you know, just to talk about some of those guys who, who played for us last year, Billy Finn comes to mind first of all. He's kind of uh, our Mister Do Do Everything. He lines up at running back. He lines up in the slot. Wildcat quarterback. Defensively, he's a safety. He's a linebacker. He's played pretty much every position since he's been here. Um, on up on the on. 
up front with our line, we got Vinny Nikolic, uh, Lawson Fisher, and uh, Brandon Baum, who all were starters last year, at least on one side of the ball, and they're, they're back this year as being two-way starters. Um, so, you know, one of the main reasons for our success is our ability to stop the run, and, and that's three out of our four starting D linemen right there that I mentioned. Um, so, uh, they've been doing a great job for us. Uh, a couple other guys that come to mind is our uh, leading rusher and leading scorer is Abid Johnny Mendez. He kind of filled in the role for Kazakowski, and he's our uh, one of our big play threats who uh, seems as if he has the ability to break it every anytime he touches the ball. So, um, you know, he's our, our big weapon that we try to get the ball to a- any way possible. A uh, couple other guys that, that come to mind, we got in the secondary, uh, Jacob, Mu- Jacob Munoz is our free safety. He was our starter last year. He, he went down. After the first week of the season, I think he we lost him for, for the majority of the season to an injury. Uh, at cornerback, we got, got Tyler Aponte, and then uh, middle linebacker Regan Landrigan and uh, wide receiver Joe Ivanovic. So I think I named pretty much all the guys who have uh, started for us, uh, mm-hmm. our returning starters for last year. So I want to say that a lot of our success has just been them kind of stepping it up, knowing it's their time, and, and, and you know they've done a great job so far. How about numbers-wise? I mean... Uh... You know, that's been a recurring theme we've been talking about all season here. Hey, it's never going to be big at a Group 2 school. We know that. But, you know, uh, you know, considering where you have been in the past to where you are now, uh, how's the feeder system doing? I mean, you know, because I always think when I think of Rutherford, I think baseball. I mean, cold days down on the banks of the Passaic River uh, covering, the, you know, the, those games. And uh, Rutherford generally considered to be a baseball town. How about the football side of it uh, for you? Well, I- we uh, we're fortunate this year with numbers. Surprisingly, it's uh, the fact that we have a, a pretty heavy junior and senior class. When you get two classes who are back to back like that with good numbers, they're pretty much going to carry your program, and that's what we got right now. Uh, you know, our fre- our sophomores are a little lower. We only got about ten sophomores, and then the freshmen took a, a hit this year. I think we only have six freshmen in the program. So, uh, you know, a total of about forty three, I want to say. Uh, which is very good for all the first going yeah. back a few years ago. I remember in 2013, we were down to about 17 kids at one point. We were just, hmm. you know, we were on life support. You know, we managed to, uh, to pull through, but, uh, that's very, uh, common in a small school like Rutherford. It's really, it, it's like a roller coaster. You know, you're up, you're down. Um, you, you saw I'd been here eight years. We started up. We, we, we had two rebuilding years that were, we were down and, and now we finally got it back up again. So our goal, is to uh, try to eliminate those rebuilding years and just try to, you know, turn Rutherford into a, a small school power where we could compete every single year. Um, it really starts with with getting at the feeder programs and, and you know keeping our kids home. And you know, the the evidence is there. When we had kids who all stayed home, we had successful runs. When we when we lost kids, uh, you know, then we had those rebuilding years. So that's really where it, where, where it starts. Yep, absolutely. Brian, go ahead. Hey, um, good point there, Coach. Uh, we had Billy Wild on the show from New Milford. He mentioned the same thing about his program is keeping his kids in town, and that's the key to his success over there. Um, my question for you tonight, I mean, the NJIC, Jimmy's a big NJIC guy. I, we follow them a lot. I uh, think it's very competitive. Um, I think there's a big opportunity for you here coming up. This is a big league championship game for you to win the Liberty Division. Tell us, talk about this game. You know, the team you're going to compete with looks very similar to you. You got they've only given up 30 points this year on defense. You guys given up 30. Um, you guys both look like your offense is very similar. I see them at about 25 points a game. You guys about 28. I mean, you guys, I see mirror image of each other. What do you see here coming up this weekend? I see uh, a lot of speed and athleticism. Ooh, they are Manchester's loaded this year. You know mm-hmm. they they got it going over there. You know, coach uh, coach Roke has done a, a, a tremendous job with that squad. Amazing where they are, you know, and they deserve it. You know, they, you know, coming from where they where they've come and where they are now, uh, they got athletes all over the field, and it's going to be our toughest test that we've had in a long time. Just it's it, coincidentally, it comes down to the, it's the league championship, just the way you know it all worked out with being a week seven game and two undefeated teams. It's our uh, it's our homecoming game, so it's really uh, it's really cool. I would uh, suggest everybody come out to uh, Rutherford this Saturday. It's going to be pretty electric, hopefully. You well, heard uh, that? They're a very good football team. 
you know, Brian Carr, very he just got them all pumped up. He, you know what? Look at when you get to practice tomorrow. Look out in the parking lot. Brian Carr is going to be, uh, <laughs> he's going to be taking pictures. He's going to be already scoping out the scene just to see where he's going to be standing on Saturday afternoon. He's pumped. Well, listen, Brian, if you do that, don't give away any of our secrets. Right? No, you're. You're okay this week, Coach. I won't be back in town until Wednesday, so maybe Thursday you'll have to prepare. You know, I'll be in the parking lot. He's the guy. He's the guy who sends out the uh, the the tweet at about you know if he's going. I think Bergen Catholic last week. He sent out the tweet about uh, ten fifteen. He pulled into the parking lot. <laughs> you know, he shows the cones. The guys directing traffic. But I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt your flow there. Continue on the breakdown of Manchester. If you had something else to say, I'm just pointing out our own neuroses over here. <laughs> we definitely know we got our work cut out for us this week. Our kids know that. This is a very talented football team we're playing. They got athletes all over the field. You know, it makes them scary that they can uh you know, they they, they got big playability, they can break it at any time. They they got a quarterback who's real smooth that back there. It's not something that you see every day in a wing T offense that you know, that they have such an effective passing attack like they do. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you talked about their defense. I mean they're this defense is legit. They're fast. They run to the football. They're tough. And I want to correct you. I think you said they, they scored 30 points. So they allowed 30 points all year, but I'm pretty sure it's uh, 21 points. I think it's 20. So. <laughs> I think it's, it's 20. Yeah, 20 points. I think it was 20 you're, you're points. Right. It's 20. Right. A whole year. And I think right. we allowed year, 30. So. Right. But uh, they're uh, – so this is by first, this is going to be a challenge for us. You know, it's really going to come down to, uh, you know, executing the fundamentals and, and limiting our mistakes, a team that makes the less – the fewer mistakes is, is probably going to end up on top. So hopefully, hopefully that's we're the more disciplined team this Saturday. Yeah, I, you know, d- d- Brian mentioned the NJIC thing, and uh, listen, it's the greatest thing for these small schools to have this to shoot for. Um, you know, uh, the state playoffs. You got to a state final. You got to the state. You know, uh, playoffs last year too, and all that's important. But you know, it was such a smashing success the NJIC tournament when it was instituted last year. How much you, do you talk to your kids about, you know, it's something else to play for, it's, and it's something unique in New Jersey. Nobody else is doing this. You know, ha, has it become uh, uh, as big a thing as we all seem to think it is from the outside looking in, uh, you know, at these programs here? I absolutely love the format. I think it's, it's uh, brilliant. I know uh, Charlie Voorhees pretty much implemented this whole thing. He was the, uh, the mad scientist behind the whole thing. But uh, it just makes so much sense with the PowerPoint. You know, there's a couple of reasons why I like it. Number one, you're maximizing your PowerPoint. You know, so if you're a team at the top of the, br- the bracket, you, you know, you're going to benefit from that. If you're a team at the bottom of the division, you're going to play a competitive game that you can win. And, uh, you know, and, and, and secondly, it's just going to prepare you for the state playoffs. You're going to be playing tough, meaningful football in weeks eight and nine, where, you know, that's when you want to be playing your best in November when you're going into those state games. So, yep. You know, of course, it's the state. I love, the, I love the system. I don't know how the. Uh, I know that's a pretty much a general consensus from everybody in the NJSC. I don't know how outside coaches and in, in the different and other conferences feel about it, but you know, I think it's brilliant. I think it's exciting. You know, you got a playoff built within the regular season. Um, I don't want to say that we talked about it too much with our team because we like to stay in the moment and just focus on the, you know, one game at a time and just you know winning each individual day so really all we're worried about right now is manchester and that and we know those njic playoffs ain't happening if we don't take care of business this week so yeah but yeah it's a it's a, it's a great thing and uh you know hopefully we could get there you know last year we lost in a tough game to pompton in the semifinals um you know yeah but i just remember it was a, it was like a it was a real exciting uh moment you know being in, in those njic games so hopefully we could get back yeah uh, that's right next year. I- I even forgot that you guys were included last year. That's uh, that's on me. Uh, yeah. But that, yeah, that's true. Jimmy, do you have another one? Yeah, coach. Obviously, we mentioned a win not only wins you the division, uh, but it gives you a spot in the semifinals of the NJSC. But it also, I mean, currently you're sitting fifth in power points with a game in hand. You know, you beat Manchester. That's a, a bonanza of power points that can really move you up. You know, in that North Two Group Two bracket, obviously, is very tough bracket of Mount Lakes, Caldwell, Lenape Valley, Whippity Park. That yep. would really go a long way to moving you up into, you know, possibly a a first, definitely a first round home game, and possibly two home games. So, how important is is that win against Manchester for that side of it? 
Oh, that, that's huge. You know, I mean, you're absolutely right with that. We have a loaded section. Um, you know, we need to to win some games here in order to get a a home playoff game. That's really our goal. We want to at least get a get a first round home playoff game, be a top four. You know, the last two years we were lucky enough to be uh, a top two seed where we get home field advantage. So, you know, if we could, you know, if we could get to that point, I think that would be tremendous. But uh, we know that uh, this could be a, a huge step for us if we could we could take care of business on Saturday. That could kind of that might be able to solidify us a, a home playoff game. And uh, you know we got a very tough road ahead of us because there's going to be no uh, every game from this point out is going to be a dogfight, and and we know that. So you know we just got to keep getting better every week, and and hopefully be rolling on uh, full steam come playoff time. Yep. Yeah. Right. You got w- one yeah. last thing for the coach before we let him out of uh, here. Oh, oh, the most important thing, coach. You mentioned the game was on Saturday. What time is the start time? <laughs> one o'clock. Start time is one important. o'clock. One o'clock. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah. yeah I, we would look forward to, uh, to asking you further questions uh, next week after if they win the game. That would be a, a good thing. If you can win the game, that would be great. Yeah. So please do us a favor and win the game, Coach. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't, I can't make you any promises, but uh, we're certainly going to do our best, that's for sure. Yes, and we will be on we'll, we'll be on hand to see it. Uh, certainly. It's going to be exciting. Listen, it's time. Turning the corner here, Toy. It finally got cold. It uh, feels like football weather. Playoffs are in the air. Playoffs on the line this weekend. Everything. So all that's right with high school football happening this weekend down in Rutherford at Tryon Field. Andy Howell, the head coach of the Rutherford Bulldogs, a pleasure to have you on again this season. And uh, good luck. And good luck with Brian Carr stalking your sidelines on Saturday afternoon. Thanks so much. I, uh, I really appreciate you having me on the show again. All right. Interesting stuff there with the coaches here on this edition of the Monday Morning Quarterback. And now let's clean up the loose ends that we left from earlier on in the show. We took care of the non-public stuff earlier. We obviously went in-depth in the NJIC. Uh, let's talk about what's going on on the public school side of the North Jersey Super Football Conference. As I mentioned at the top of the show, there were not that many much must see games. I was at uh, Demarest game against Pascag Valley. Uh, that was a good win for Demarest on Friday night. Their first win in Hillsdale since 1995. Their first overall against PV uh, since 2004. So that's where I was then. And on Saturday, I went down. You know, I, I've been running around so much this season uh, doing photo shoots and so many various different things that it has kept me away from uh, having, you know, waking up in the morning and say, hey, what game do I want to cover? I got an empty schedule here. I'm just going to pick where I want to go. Saturday was one of those rare days for me. So I decided to head down to Englewood. Uh, As I mentioned, my wife has been a teacher there for over 20 years. So I like to get back. It's almost, you know, a little hometown flavor for us. Uh, I had my four-year-old nephew at the game, my daughter. We went down. It was homecoming, a very good crowd at Winton White Stadium. And uh, Dwight Maul really needed to win the game. They had a nice, impressive start to the season, 3-0. and They had a hiccup against Paramus. They got uh, beat up a little bit by Ramapo. So they needed the win to get back in the playoff picture. And they got it against Brian Carr's beloved Dumont Huskies. I will say a couple things about it. First of all, Jimmy, Dwight Morrow's skill position players, when you talk about kids that we have when we had Joe Hoyle on earlier in the season – when you talk about Andrew Lewis, when you talk about Malachi McFadden, when you talk about George Garrison the third, and when you talk about Quanzi Lumsden, who's uh, a, a, a physical—I mean, he's the biggest of the bunch. He's fast. He's all over the field. I mean, that's almost in non-public category when you're talking about skill position players. Yeah, I don't think there's any question, and it's no disrespect to anybody else, but I think Dwight Morrow has the best set of skill kids in public football in North Jersey. I mean, they're all athletic. They're all three-year starters. Uh, you mentioned Lumsden, obviously, Division One prospect. And, uh, you know, not to put anything down, but all of those kids would fit in very nicely in the, in the non-public. Yeah, and that's a credit to Englewood that those kids are playing for the hometown team. I mean, they kept them home, and uh, they're gearing up. But, Bri, I, I want to say here, it, you know, Anglewood did win the game. Dwight Moore did win the game, forty-six twenty-nine. Improved to four and two heading into the game uh, against Demarest this this upcoming Friday night here. But 
all is not lost for the hometown Huskies, Brian Carr, because there's a lot of good things going on around there. First of all, Ricky Bird, the first-year head coach, is a Dumont graduate, so he's obviously got pride of program, no doubt about that. The offensive coordinator is Mike Farrington, former head coach at uh, Elmwood Park, former offensive coordinator at Richfield Park, former assistant at Demarest. Uh, They're organized. They play smart. They ran a lot of misdirection. They were able to make some big plays against uh, a superior against the superior speed of Dwight Morrow. So while this year, you know, the the record doesn't show it for sure, but they're uh, better than that record might suggest. And you know, I I think Dumont, you know, in subsequent years here on this show, Ricky Bird will accept an invitation to join us and talk about how he's built this thing here at Dumont. Right. Hey, I agree. I was reading your story because you, we only get my news from NorthJerseySports.com. And I was reading your story on the game because, you know, I had to get it somewhere. And, yeah. And um, I see that Dumont was only down. It was 26-21 going into the fourth quarter. Yeah. So, like I like to say to the kids, very competitive. Um, and let's also, you know, Jake Veachie, the junior quarterback, had three TDs and ran for another. Yeah. So, you know, the guys are playing. The kids aren't quitting. And Ricky's not going to let them, you know. And so let's keep going, Huskies. And my buddy Stephen Capone, who we had on the show earlier this year, Stephen, I know he's fighting and he doesn't want to lose. So, you know, he's going to, I think, keep him going. And so it's good to see, you know, kids want to win. And it's playing a game and having fun. So yes. uh, we enjoy that. Yeah, and they're going to be able to get into the junior programs and, and, and really build it up. So I expect good things out of Dumont. You know, I was talking to Mike Pito, their athletic director. You know, my father-in-law was the athletic director in Dumont for many years. And the one, the history of Dumont football, it's, it's not recent history. The overall history of Dumont football, it's not like it's a, a you know an all-time winner. So, it, you know, you're, you're basically starting from scratch. And uh, But I think they have the right crew in place to uh, get that done. All right. So I gave you the time to talk about the merits of the Huskies. <laughs> I talked about Dwight Morrow, one of my favorite teams uh, this year. But let's talk about the big boys on the public school side. And this weekend there should be some exciting games, Jimmy, starting with where I believe you are leaning toward heading on Friday night. It is defending North 1 Group 3 State sectional champion, the undefeated Riverdale Golden Hawks, they're going to host Ramapo in what should be a barn burner. Uh, I don't think there's any question. I mean, two very, very good teams. Riverdale, the favorite in their section. Ramapo always very, very dangerous. And it's nice to see this year that the game is going to mean something because I know in the past they've played and it's been after power points have been done and, and who's rested who and, and who's kept who healthy. But I think this year it certainly means something. And obviously, where Vidal is led by their outstanding quarterback, uh, Estevez, and, and Ramapo, obviously, offensively, is very talented as well. So yep. that's going to be a real that, – that should be a real shootout and a real playoff atmosphere Friday night at Riverdale. Yep, Dave Estevez and A.J. Wingfield, uh, two very good quarterbacks in, in that game. And uh, it, it, that's going to be a lot of fun. I'll just point out a couple of other ones that I thought were interesting. Well, it's going to, you know, Northern Valley Old Japan, we had Brian Dunn on the show last week, and they've had, you know, I don't want to say a cake schedule, but again, I'll say a cake schedule last couple of weeks. gets a little bit harder this week. Uh, Northern Highlands will be the host, 5-1 and one Northern Highlands. So maybe Old Japan gets a little bit more of a challenge this week, Brian. Yeah, I think so. Northern Highlands uh, coached by... Uh... Uh, was it uh, what's Russo's first name, Jimmy? I think Greg Russo, right? Uh, Greg Russo, the offensive coordinator. Greg yeah. Russo, formerly over at Promise Catholic, uh, helped them win a couple state championships at Promise Catholic. So, I, I think you know they were good last year, and they're sneaking up. And Ultimate is going to have a little bit of a, a competitive uh, situation there, which is good for them, as Coach Dunn had told us. You know, is got to keep the kids fresh. Uh, moving on to one other game I saw, and we talked about earlier. Um, you know, we're going to talk about with Coach Rutherford. Manchester should be another barn burner and a really good match this weekend uh, in addition to these. Oh, I'm sorry. One other one I was – we're going to talk about later with Coach, but the westwood Ramsey game is the big game. Westwood needing it for power points, hopefully getting some home games and not wanting to travel. We talked about going up to Newton uh, to stay away from uh, an undefeated 6-0 Newton team. 
The other team in the match there is Ramsey, and they're playing for their playoff. You know, very competitive team. Always gives uh, Westwood a hard time. Um, and Rams, Ramsey is fighting for their playoff, you know, some seeding there too as well. Yep. Yeah, they're uh, fifth in North 1 Group 2, and this is their last game before the PowerPoint cutoff. So uh, it's a, this is definitely an important one. The other one that I see too, and this uh, makes for an interesting decision on Saturday, you got Rutherford Manchester, but you also have Passaic Valley playing at home on the grass against the Wayne Hills. Passaic Valley 5-1, and one, Wayne Hills 4-2. and two. And PV it gets a chance to prove itself here. I mean, they've built a nice record. They haven't played the toughest of schedules. And undoubtedly, Jimmy, the road to supremacy in Passaic County public school football goes directly through the Wayne Hills Patriots. So, you know, it, it is PV for real? I think they are. Let's see what happens against Wayne Hills. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's a test, certainly, for the Hornets. Uh, Coach Paul Vecchio will have them ready for Wayne <laughs> Wayne Hills, there's no question about that. I mean, their only loss is a, a one-point loss to, to a good Lakeland team, but I think you hit it on the head. The rest of the schedule, West Milford, Wayne Valley, Orange, Belleville, and Indian Hills haven't been much of a challenge. So, uh, obviously, Wayne Hills will be a big challenge. It should be rocking at, at the Sake Valley High School on Saturday. No doubt. Yep, Wayne Hills and Irvington in the next two weeks for Passaic Valley. So their uh, schedule was certainly backloaded. I think Irvington is 4-2 or uh, something. I looked it up earlier, but I, I don't remember off the top of my head. But it should be interesting. And listen, things he, we had a little bit of a lull. Things are heating back up on the North Jersey football scene, and they will stay that way the rest of the way because every game, you know, now we get to weed out some teams here. Uh, we're going to focus on the ones that are driving for the playoffs, the ones that are in the driver's seat for playoff spots and positioning. We will do it all next week and beyond. Thanks for joining us here on the Monday Morning Quarterback. Follow the leader.